Hey everyone, we're live. John Dye here with Corey Andrews. Corey, how are you? Awesome. So good. How are you, John? Good. Good, good. Awesome. People will have to excuse our uh, headphones today, but uh, we want to break down the, the ambient noise as much as we can, right? That's right. I got kids screaming in the background, so yeah. I tried to try to hide that as much as I can. <laughs> That's a typical Sunday afternoon at most exactly. uh, LDS households, right? So, yes, sir. awesome. Well, hey, we have had some people join us. The fun thing is, if you type anything out in the comments below, we can share that. So hey. Terry Carlson is excited about this. Terry, if you're on, go ahead Thanks and say joining. something. Great. Grady Kerr. He's, oh, he's got church until six, so he can't join us today. Oh, so. man. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in the future. So. Oh, lo love Grady. Yes, he's wonderful. Well, hey, we're going to talk a few things uh, today. Mainly, we're going to talk about this volume. Uh, let's see if I can get it here where people can see it. Saints, the standard of truth, right? The new volume that just released. So, Corey, you have some interesting things you can tell us about this first volume. This will be the first of four. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, why um, you're on and why you have some insider information. Tell us what you do uh, during the day for your full-time job and maybe some of the, the fun things that one of the uh, editors helped you out with. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm so excited about Saints and to talk about that today. So thanks again, John, for letting me come on and, and share some of the thoughts and, and feelings I've had as I've started to jump in and read it. Uh, so a little bit about me real quickly. My name is Corey Andrews. I, uh, um, I, so f I live in Springville, Utah. I grew up in Idaho. Uh, shout out to all my Idaho homies out there. If, if you, any of you, uh, my Idaho friends are jumping on, please uh, let us know in the comments. Um, uh, I guess part of the reason I have a little insight in the saints is because for my full-time job, I'm a seminary teacher. So I, I teach seminary full-time here in Utah and, uh, love that. But as, uh, and we had an opportunity this summer where Stephen Harper, one of the managing directors over the Saints program, or, or managing editors, I should say, uh, over uh, the, this first volume and all the volumes in the series, uh, he came and he talked to us and he gave us a little bit of background and, and shared with us uh, his excitement. I think that was one of the fun things to see how excited he was uh, as a historian, uh, but also just as a lover of church history in general, he was so excited to share these thoughts and ideas and, and how it came about. And so I'm, I, I got me excited and I couldn't wait uh, to get my copy. And, and since I've gotten my copy, I've jumped in and, and I've even started reading it. I have little kids, uh, but I've re read just little sections every night to, to my kids the last few nights. And that's been a really fun uh, to just, just a little bit and try to make it interesting and fun for them. And, uh, and so, yeah, I'm excited. I guess another thing about me real quickly is I also run a Facebook page called High Five Live, uh, where we share live inspiring, inspiring messages every day. Uh, so I love sharing the gospel online. I love doing live videos. Uh, so when, uh, John mentioned this, I jumped at the opportunity to come on and join him live to the, tonight. Awesome. Thanks, Corey. Yeah, that's great. And we love what you do on High Five Live. If you guys haven't subscribed to that and do that right now. Also, tell us where you're watching from. We've got uh, some people that have jumped on, and we'd love to, uh, to hear where you're watching from. Also, let us know if you have Saints right now, if you have this volume. Uh, do you have the print version like I do? Um, do you have the uh, digital version? You can get it on Kindle for free. You can get it on the, uh, uh, on the Gospel Library app for free. You can even listen to it. Have you listened to any of the chapters, Corey, or have you mainly been... Uh, just reading it with your family. So last night when I knew I was coming on, I had a ton going on uh, and I was actually washing dishes. And so while I was washing dishes. I listened to chapter one, one more time. <laughs> awesome. Just to get ready for today, right? That's right. To get excited for today. All right. That's great. That's great. Well, Hey, let's talk about the, the introductory sections and also chapter one really quick. First yeah. of all, I have a question for you. Why now? This is the third, um, I want to say, historical um, volume, you know, of the history of the church. Um, why did it come out now? The first one was, was started, obviously, with the Prophet Joseph. Then I want to say in 1930s, B.H. Roberts did one. This is really the, the third time that the church has done this officially. Why, why do you think now? Why in 2018 would we start doing this uh, 
this new four volume? Yeah, I think, I think there's lots of reasons. Um, one, I think because of uh, the information age that we live in, there's so much that we're just bombarded with, right? As far as information and you can, you can Google church history, LDS church history or, or uh, history of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints uh, to be more correct today. Uh, and you could find lots of different <laughs> things, right? Um, sure. And so I love this history that it is, it's bringing the truth, right? And that was one of the things that Stephen Harper uh, stressed that we are going to tell the true story uh, and, the, and uh, in a narrative format and in an engaging way. But it's going to be truth and it's going to be things that are interesting and things that maybe people haven't heard about before. And so yeah. I think it's a great way to find answers to questions, but also be engaged at the same time. Absolutely. One of the interesting things for me, and we'll start going through this a little bit, but uh, the newsroom put out a video. It's on YouTube right now, but it, um, they were talking to one of the church historians, and I can't remember who at the moment, but uh, she mentioned, you know, the the female members of the church yeah. who had such a strong um, impact on what happened in the early church, they are going to be highlighted in these volumes. And um, you know, traditionally, when you think of history, you know, the saying is what history is written by the victors, something to that effect. Um, sometimes history is written by the leaders. And um, what I'm excited about is learning about some of the lay members of the church. And we'll talk about that a little bit more um, because that goes through in the preface a little bit. Um, message from the First Presidency, though, they start off in this volume saying some really, I think, impactful things. There are multiple things that they said, but two that hit me really hard were um, remembering our shared legacy. You know, talk a little bit about the power of remembrance and remembering. You know, we hear that in the sacramental prayers. We hear that um, obviously a lot in the Book of Mormon. Why, why that word remember and why is that so important for this volume? Yeah, I believe it was Ezra Taft Benson that mentioned that, uh, that it's one of the most important words that we can find in the scriptures. And uh, so it's a, obviously a powerful wor word. And I think especially when we're remembering the stories, um, I think one of the things that Stephen Harper said uh, when he came is that uh, our, our stories tell us who we are. And, mm. who's, and then he said, and whose we are. And I love that. Right? Oh, very good. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, there's another quote that I really love uh, that, that says that our stories connect us to each other and our stories connect us to God. And if you think about scriptures, uh, you know, the Book of Mormon and, and the Old Testament and the New Testament, they're, they're really stories. Uh, there's lots that contained in the scriptures. There's lots of stories that we can use to read and enjoy, but also that they connect us to each other and to God. And so I feel like, um, though not canonized, right? We can, we can be connected to God by reading saints. Wonderful. That's great. That's a great way to look at it. Um, again, people, if you have comments, drop those below and we can show some of those. There's some great things coming in. So uh, appreciate everybody watching. So remembering our shared legacy. Um, also talk about the importance of a narrative history of the church. Um, let's be honest, um, histories can put people to sleep pretty quick if they're not written correctly. Why a narrative history of the church? What do you think? Why, why this form of narrative? Yeah. Uh, and I, and I saw this in, in one of the videos that, uh, on Mormon newsroom where they mentioned, uh, where Stephen Harper mentioned that it's, it's similar to an epic tale. Uh, right, like uh, epic stories that people love to read. They they wrote it in a narrative form where people can read the story. And there's a main character, right? And he's going to go through challenges and trials. And uh, and even even if I, as I've listened to it, though I know the stories, right? I know these stories. I know what's going to happen. It's engaged me, my emotions, and and uh, raised my blood pressure a little bit at moments when I'm like is it really going to work out? Like what's going to happen with this, you know, 116 pages? I don't know. Like is Joseph going right, to be forgiven? Right. <laughs> you know, that right. type of stuff. Right. And so I think there's power in, in the narrative form uh, and, and, and connecting us to the story. Yeah, I believe it. I believe it. We'll talk a little bit more about that too as we talk about the preface. But one other thing I wanted to talk about, and this again is in the message from the First Presidency, it says you are an important part of the continuing history of this church. Mm -hmm. Why do you think they included that? What is the significance of that statement? Ooh, that's a powerful question. Uh, it's not just the stories, right, that connect us to God, but I think our own stories can. 
if we're really looking. Uh, another thing that I remember that Stephen Harper mentioned when he came and spoke to us is he said, if I was teaching seminary this year, I would try to help students realize where their story fits in Heavenly Father's plan for them. And I thought that's a, that's a powerful way that we can find that, the, our stories, by reading these stories of, of, of early church members. And uh, we can really see they went through challenges. They weren't perfect, and neither are we. And we can be inspired by their actions. Very good. I, I love that. And, and I believe that's specifically what the youth, but all of us want to know, right? How do we fit into this tapestry of the restoration? And we'll talk a little bit more about that, too, because that is a phrase that is used in the preface as well. Um, you know, within the preface, it's interesting because it starts off by saying this, Brigham Young recommended historians write in a narrative style and write one-tenth as much. Um, we talked a little bit about narrative style, but talk about length because one interesting thing about saints is the chapters, right? The chapters are relatively short. I mean, you can sit down and di digest most of them, I'd say within five, seven, ten minutes, maybe a little bit longer depending on how quickly you read, but um, I do you know, talk about the length of the chapters. So. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's great. That's great. It takes a while to cogitate, right? Yeah. Yeah. So talk about the length of the chapters, though. Why do you think uh, they are, I won't say so, so short, but they're digestible? I will say that. Yeah. I, I think they did a masterful job in writing this in that you, in just a couple of paragraphs, they can really help you connect. You really connect to a small part of the story. Uh, I noticed that in um, reading chapter one, I know we're going to talk about that in just a second, but reading chapter one, there's a part where uh, Lucy Mack is taking her family and it's only a couple of paragraphs long, but you really connect with the story and, and you feel for her and the little challenge that she goes through there. And, uh, but, but they do that in a masterful way that I think engages you and keeps the story moving. So you're not getting bored. Yes. Yes. And we know that Saints will have a total of four volumes. Um, we just have the first volume released right now. Do you know when the other three will be coming? Have you heard any dates? Ooh, I, I do not. I, I want to say that the next one is going to be coming in the next year, but I think that was a guess and probably not something I should have said. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll hold them to that because Brother Corey Andrews there you said go. Yeah, Exactly. Don't quote me on All that. Right? <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll try to find that out and drop it in the comments below in the deal. <laughs> yeah. That's great. That's great. Uh, again, one of the key things I think about saints is, and we discussed this before, but it is telling the lives and the stories of ordinary men and women in the church. I, I know it goes through some of the early black members of the church. Um, I know that it talks about a lot of the, the, uh, the sisters in the church, the females that had a large impact. So I think that's huge because here's that quote that I, that I mentioned before, woven together their stories. So these ordinary men and women, their stories create the rich tapestry of the restoration. And I think that harks back to what we talked about with the First Presidency. You are an important part of the continuing history of this church. This is a, a living narrative. The, the, the narrative of the church is living. It's something that's ongoing right now. We talk about the restoration of the gospel. It's still happening. The gospel is still being restored in its fullness. And our stories weave into that restoration. What are your thoughts on that, Corey? Yeah, oh, that's that, that's a powerful way to think about it. That we are a part. That that, that what we do today with uh, our membership in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints will affect those in the future, right? Maybe there'll be a fifth volume one day, and we'll, that'll be us. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, well, that's great. Um, just looking here at time, uh, we've got a little bit longer, so let's go ahead and and go through a few. Well, we've got uh, some people that are giving us love eye emojis. Oh, I love the love eyes, yeah. So some people are really enjoying that, I guess. Um, so appreciate that. Let's, uh, let's talk about chapter one. Let's delve into that a little bit. Chapter one deals with uh, my servant, Joseph. So it's really a little bit about the context behind why the Smiths left Vermont, ended up in upstate New York and some of those things. So... Maybe you can tell us a little bit about 1815. There was the volcano Tambora on that Indonesian island of uh, Sambawa. 
that erupted. Why is that important in this whole tapestry of the restoration? <laughs> Honestly, I love that this is how they decided to start the story with this volcano, kind of because uh, with, when I started reading it to my children, they just started calling it the volcano story. Like, let's read the volcano story, right? Because that's how we started. And, and they, really connected, they really connected with that because we play The Ground is Lava all the time. And so... Um, <laughs> I, I like that. But then when I went and shared that with my seminary students, uh, there was kind of this apprehension like, wait, God made a volcano destroy all these people and, you know, and just to get Joseph Smith to Palmyra. Uh, so let, let me tell a little bit of the background. So this volcano goes off in uh, 1815, I believe. Is that right, John? That's correct. 1815. Yep. So the volcano goes off and it affects the world's climate. Uh, a lot of destruction and uh, around the volcano, but the ash sent into the air affects the world's climate. And so since the, it ends up being like this summer without a summer, uh, this year without a summer uh, because of what happened with the volcano. And that affects the Smith family so much so that they have to leave their home in Vermont and move. They decide to move to Palmyra. But when I told that to my students, they were like, wait, really? Like that's it. But then I, I found this quote, and this is something Stephen Harper shared with us as well. He said this, the story begins in 1815 with the explosion of the Indonesian volcano, which caused widespread death, disease, disruption. This beginning point was chosen in light of what the Savior revealed about how the restored covenants that bind us and help us to overcome all of life's problems. I, the Lord, knowing the calamity which should come upon the, upon the inhabitants of the earth, called upon my servant Joseph Smith. And I love that perspective, right? That all, in the time we live, there is calamity, there is destruction, there is even war, there is uh, disease, and there's all these things. Um, but we can also trust that the Lord has a plan and that that plan yeah. is for ultimately the happiness of all of his children. I love that. That's great. Thank you for finding that so quickly. That was a great quote. Um, talk a little bit too. <laughs> this is interesting, but we know Moses parted the Red Sea. Um, and that was done with the power of the priesthood, but talk about, um, as you talked about with your students, the power of, of nature, you know, God, we know is subject to laws just like anyone else. So when we think about miracles, they're miracles because we can't as mortal beings wrap our mind around them. It doesn't mean that they, um, we, it doesn't mean that, uh, God intercedes in a way that breaks natural law, right? He has to right. live within the bounds of natural law. We know that he is, he, he is subject to those same laws because those, those laws are truth and will be true now and forevermore. Yeah. But, uh, um, you know, when you think about parting the Red Sea, I remember when I was 14, I, uh, I had a uh, home teacher who, who asked me a little bit about that. And I'd never thought about that before, that, hmm. you know, parting the Red Sea, there probably was some natural calamity that could account for that just because we know that God has to um, work with the natural law as well. So anyway, just some thoughts. Yeah. And that, um, it's cool to see how God prepares a way for his plans and his yes. purposes to be fulfilled. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, any other thoughts because our, our time is running out and I definitely want to uh, be able to attend face here at six o'clock thoughts that stood out to you as we, read through chapter one, anything that you didn't realize that you now realize or, or things that you think are, are worthy of noting? I think uh, one thing you've already mentioned, the, the, they highlight the power of, of womanhood. And, and uh, I, I loved learning more about Lucy Mack and her strength. And in that story that I mentioned with their, uh, their wagon driver, uh, their teamster, uh, who uh, struggled on the on their trip where uh, Lucy's trying to take her eight children to Palmyra all by herself. And I love seeing the, her, her power and her persistence and her faith uh, that helped her take her whole family almost single-handedly because this man wouldn't help them very much uh, to, to Palmyra. And I, and I think uh, the thing that uh, really uh, connected to that, the thing that really touched me was um, Joseph's parents and their desire to know truth and how Joseph, uh, as a child, in, ends up being this incredible blessing to his family. And, uh, yeah. and because he found truth, and so did they. And uh, I just think about in our, in our desires and in our search for truth, how we can be a blessing for our families. And, 
that, I don't know, that's what stood out to me the most in chapter one. How about you, John? What, what stood out to that's you? That's great. You know, some of the contextual things, and this is uh, somewhat interesting, but the Mr. Howard that you mentioned, the, uh-huh. the uh, one that was hired to bring them to Palmyra, just, I, I'd never heard that before. And I don't know yeah. if that's just, I haven't delved deep enough, but yeah, there were some um, things that, some, some incidents in the restoration that I think a lot of us aren't aware of. This was obviously documented somewhere and just what a colorful figure he was. And, <laughs> you know, I don't think we would have known about him without a volume like, like Saints. Um, right. At least it wouldn't be digestible by the, the average lay member of the church. I thought that was very interesting. Um, I, I will say this too. I think the fact that it put all of this into perspective, starting with Tambora and how that impacted Vermont, which impacted why they moved, which impacted Joseph and what he was thinking and just his age. I, I really hadn't considered his age because I think he was seven-ish or so when um, when the volcano erupted. And just thinking through all of these different steps in his life that led to Hill Camorra in Palmyra, which led to um, the first vision, um, obviously not in that order, first vision first, but all of these um, sequences that laid out the process for the restoration. Um, like you said, Heavenly Father, he loves us. He is. He understands what the plan is. He understands how to get there and, and the end game, and he'll prepare a way for us to do that. And I, I will say this, it was never easy. It wasn't easy for anyone within these volumes. And I think that gives us the faith and helps us build the persistence that we need to face the trials that we have. Because sometimes I think, at least when I personally look back on what Joseph went through, I know he had a hard time, but this humanizes him in a way, I think, that I haven't felt before, that I can understand, again, the context behind what has happened and what is happening with him and his family, and therefore why the outcome was like it was. Like you said, we know the outcome, right? We know what's going to happen. We know the 116 pages are going to be lost. But <laughs> why Why did it happen in the way that it did? Sometimes yeah. we just hear the end that it was lost. But if we can understand all of the dominoes that had to fall for that to be lost, and we can see that Martin Harris was a human, Joseph was a human, mm-hmm. all of the prophets and all the members of the church have issues that they have yeah. to get through to, to eventually overcome and, and to, to prosper. So for me, think, that's kind of, yeah. go ahead, go ahead. Oh, sorry to interrupt. I, I think that's what makes the, the saint so powerful is because it is so relatable and uh, that relate, relatability will turn into relevance in our lives uh, if we jump into it. So I'd encourage anybody, everybody to, to start reading it. I'm sure that's what Elder Cook's going to encourage tonight too. Absolutely. Well, Corey, thank you so much. And everyone subscribe to High Five Live. That's uh, one of Corey's yeah. brain children that has done extremely well on Facebook. Appreciate all the good things you do. You are, you're a good man. You've got a lot of good things going. And thank you for sharing so much online with, uh, with everyone. All the good, uplifting things. You as well, John. You're one of my heroes. Thanks for letting me come on and join you tonight. All right, Corey, good to see you. You too. Talk to you later. Bye, guys. Have a good night.